From the center of the universe, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, this is the SDM Show with your host, Rob Cairns. The SDM Show focuses on business, life, productivity, digital marketing, WordPress, and more. Sit back, relax, grab your favorite drink, and enjoy the show. Here is Rob. Hey, everybody. I'm Rob Cairns. I'm the founder, CEO, and chief creator of Amazing Ideas at Stunning Digital Marketing. In this podcast, I have my guest, Jason Friedman of CX Formula here, and we're going to talk about all about lead generation. Grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. This podcast is sponsored by Stunning Digital Marketing, the agency that can help protect your WordPress website today. Go to stunningdigitalmarketing.com and see what we can do to help you protect your business investment. That's stunningdigitalmarketing.com. Hey, everybody, Rob here again. And today I'm here with my guest, Jason Friedman. How are you today, Jason? I'm great, Rob. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, it's great to have you. Despite all the technical issues you and I have had together, how two tech guys can have this many issues trying to do a podcast? Like, Listen, we it. persevered, buddy. We fight, we fight through it. We fight through it. Yeah, we sure do. So I thought we'd jump in and tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into the space you're in and the whole thing about lead generation and customers. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, my my story is a little little different than uh, many. Uh, I started out in theater, so I was oh, wow. a behind the scenes guy. I was a lighting designer, lighting you know tech, and uh, mm -hmm. scene builder. I built scenery and did the lights and stuff for shows. And uh, over the years, just kind of fell in love with the whole idea of the theater and the show. And uh, I went to school for that. I have a, a degree in lighting design and technical direction. Wow. <laughs> and then um, from there, I went out on the road. I was a rock and roll roadie. So I toured with a bunch of groups like uh, Peter Gabriel, Fleetwood Mac, uh, Rush, and then went on to some more legit, like the Canadian Power Trio. You got to love Rush, right? You're, you're from yep. up there. I'm a, then, Rush uh, I'm a Rush fan, Jason. I mean, I, who's not? Who's not, right? Yeah. Um, they're amazing. And then I went on and I did some more legit theater. And, you know, Rob, the whole journey that I was on with theater, it's one of those Mr. Miyagi kind of experiences. You're learning to wax on, wax off the whole yeah. ride. And then all of a sudden you have some skills that you didn't realize you had. And my skills were about really engaging an audience. Like I understood really how to tell a story in a really uh, dimensional way that let our customers feel special and feel yeah. more engaged and be more bought in to what we were doing with them. And as a result, built a pretty big business doing that and helping others do that. That's really cool. I love the story. And I have to tell you, you know, uh, point aside, my mother actually worked with Getty Lee's mother for uh, numerous years in real estate Get business. Out. And in the other That's room, awesome. I, I have a copy of uh, Power Windows signed by Getty himself. So there you go. Amazing. All right. Good. Well, I knew yeah. I liked you for even more reasons. Right? So, <laughs> so there um, you go. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, just, so yeah, it's it's been a, it's been a journey, you know. Yeah, it has. We it's an interesting journey. Um, now, in terms of customers, it's really it's really funny. First of all, you guys have a great website. I have to tell you that number Thanks. one, it's really good. Um, isn't it all about hitting emotion with customers? And I think you talk about that on your website. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, so my hallucination, <laughs> if you will, my belief, yeah. uh, and also my everything that I've ever uh, tried, done, learned, experienced, um, shows me that it's true, that it is all about how customers feel. Right. Yeah. So if you have customers that feel accomplished, they feel like they got value, that they got results from working with you, that it was a positive experience, uh, they will tell other people you will feel better. Your employees will feel better. Right. So creating like this positive experience that, uh, you know, for customers is uh, super powerful as a tool when you wield it with intention. And so my yeah. whole business career has been all about that, helping small businesses, large businesses, universities, institutions, you name it, um, really being more intentional about 
the journey that their customers go on with them, whatever that journey happens to be, whether it's online, offline, both lines, either way. Yeah. But it is about how they feel. Yeah. And and I think a lot of people don't realize that or don't understand that. And certain businesses are more like, for example, I've got a really good friend who owns a jewelry store, an independent jewelry store. He does very well. And I can guarantee you 90% of his business um, is based on emotion. People walk in and say, I like that piece. I don't like that piece. That looks good. I don't like that good. What's the story? Why are you remodeling this? And, you know, people, it's funny. People fix stuff because of the emotional attachment to it. Not that it's worth it or not worth it. Yeah. No, 100%. Yeah. And, you know, it's. It's, it's everything like you want to do business with people that you like, right? Like you don't, you know, you, you, you prefer to buy from people that you like, you know? Yeah. And that's why, you know, look, look, even the biggest brands out there, like Amazon, like everything they do is to try and be a better, create a better experience for their customers. Cause they know that they want it to be easy. They want to remove every obstacle to something getting in a customer's way of getting what they want. And so they, yeah. we talk about this a lot in our business. We help people remove friction, right? It's, it's my belief that we as business owners, more often than not, and mostly without realizing it, we make it hard for our customers to do business with us. And we make it really hard for our customers to have a lot of success with us. And we don't realize all these kind of friction points or obstacles that we put in the way. And so I think it's really important so the thing, use your jewelry store as an example, right? If someone's coming in looking for an engagement ring, you know, if, if we make it hard for them to like, look around and learn and, and we're, we're making it an uncomfortable, unpleasant experience, they're going to go right to the next jewelry store. There's a million yeah. options out there. And our friend Google yeah. has made it super easy to find them all, right? We're one click yeah. away from the next option. So yeah. it's important. Yeah. What, in your opinion, is the number one friction point that uh, potential customers have dealing with a company? Uh, That's a loaded question, but I will tell you probably the most common (laughs) friction point I see across all industries, right? Every industry might, every business might have like a, a bigger one, but what I see in every business, right, is expectation mismatch. And so okay. more often than not, we, uh, we see that customers have an expectation whether the business has set one and managed it or not. And so if we're not careful about how we help to set and frame up expectations that our customers have, we're going to miss their expectations. And we're going to have this mismatch where they're either you know, super unhappy or uh, frustrated or what have you. And so it's really important as we look at like the journey that customers have when they enter our world and when they're in our world, when they leave our world, making sure that we really kind of pave a path and let them know what's going to be happening and how it's going to work is really important. Yeah, I I would agree with you. I mean, I think a lot of times the business owner hasn't made their expectations clear or the customer I know in my business, they don't always listen or want to listen. (laughs) And of course, and, and there's some, and there's some of that. And then, you know, I kind of I kind of describe marketing agencies, which is the business I'm in, as being a menu of services, right? If you want A, B, and C sure. off the restaurant menu, you pay for A, B, and C. And mm-hmm. customers forever are saying, I'd like D. And mm-hmm. you say to the customer, well, you can have D, but D comes at this cost or this price or this option and then the customer looks at you and says i'm not paying that so what do you do to make that customer happy yeah i mean listen i think there's always going to be that kind of a scenario right and so for me it's about explaining to customers up front like in that scenario it's like look we have a whole menu of services we have a b c d all the way to z right and and we'd love to work with you on the most appropriate services at the right time, right? It's not like D might be what you, what you want, but really you need A, B, and C first. So let's explain what this journey looks like. And let me paint a picture of how we can work together and how, when we'll get to D and when that will make more financial sense for your business, right? And so you're setting this expectation. What you're doing is you're, you're, you're laying out a path that will be a success path for them so that they can go down this road and you're even opening up this aspirational thing of like, look, I want to help you get to D 
where it makes it's a no-brainer to invest that much with D. It would it doesn't yeah. make sense right now. Like I'll sell it to you if you've kind of forced me to, or if you're yeah. even a better partner, you'd say, look, I'm not going to sell you D right now because it's not right for you right now. I don't want to take your money and and create a scenario that's not going to help you. Right. Yeah. And I think customers, most customers, a right fit customer for you will appreciate you supporting them in that way when you do it with kindness and and really it requires you though deeply understanding your customers and their business before you can get all you know go down that road and 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 understand enough to guide them that way yeah i i agree with you wholeheartedly um one of the things that we see a lot is and i'll, I'll since we're playing on the jewelry store uh scenario yeah. we'll go back to uh hello phil by the way um the uh so you've got three jewelry stores in a mall and one of the things people always do is they fight this price to the bottom. Oh, well, I'm going to sell the engagement ring for 500 bucks. I'm going to drop mm -hmm. it to 300 bucks. I personally think the race to the bottom is a race to be out of business. Um, how do you, and there's a really good book out there called the inside advantage. I don't know if I've written read it by Robert Bloom. It was written in 2009 and he talks about why you should make your business different and not fight the price to the bottom. What's your take on that? Yeah. So uh, I thank you for the recommendation. I have not read that book or even heard of it yet. So I'm going to grab a copy of that. Um, I, I will tell you that I 100% agree. So, you know, there's uh, another famous book on kind of differentiation is Blue Ocean Strategy. Yeah. Right. And so where it really looks like in this red sea of competition, you can't stand out and it is a race to the bottom. Right. And there's a great example that they use in there of like the circuses out there and Cirque du Soleil. Right. And mm -hmm. and if you look out there like Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus, that's been around forever is gone. Right. Yeah. They actually were in that scenario. They didn't differentiate. It was more of a kind of like, you know, same as the Joneses with everybody else. And they and, and then Cirque du Soleil emerged. And they're doing great. They're you know, going strong and they're charging more per ticket than the circus ever charged because they created and carved out a niche and a, a point of differentiation and they created a different value. Right. Yeah. And so um, there's another great book out there by a person by the name of Dan Ariely called Predictably Irrational. Yes. Right. And um, it's another great book, especially if you're looking at pricing your services and, and looking at how to. Um, it's, you know, it's a behavioral economics kind of book. It looks at how people make decisions about pricing and things. And so if you're thinking about like going into a mall and you're having these, you know, three seemingly identical businesses, right? A jeweler is a jeweler is a jeweler. And they have yeah. the same things. They have diamond rings for engagements. Um, like what makes them different, right? And so in, in Dan's book, he uses an example of The Economist, right? The, the newspaper uh, magazine. Um, and they did this test and they had like the digital version, which was like $59, I think. And they had the printed version, which was like $125. When they had those two options next to each other, that's what people were comparing. And what do you think? Most people bought the $59 option. So they went with the online only. Well, yep. they tried another example and they did a 59 online only, 125 print only, and 125 print and online. Now that wasn't a mistake. I said that right. There's two that are the same price, but they have both pieces in it. And so what happened there, almost everybody bought the $125 print and online. Now, why did they do that? They did that because they're comparing the value of the comparison set, which at that point was not 59 versus 125. It was 125 versus 125. So they didn't go to the lowest price option. Now this was at the, within one business. But think about this in yeah. terms of three different retailers, right? What is the package? What is the offering that you're putting together that makes it more valuable? And it's not just the stuff, right? I believe it's also the experience, the environment, the relationship with the salespeople. So when you start to think about this in your business, you, it's creating context. Like Cirque du Soleil reinvented what circus means, right? And they created a whole new value and context of value. And so the ticket was worth more to people and they were willing to pay for it. So in your business, I, I think it's really important and incumbent upon you to really look at what is that value equation. And if you're just trying to go like that race to the bottom is it's a race to your death. It really is. Right. It's, 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 you want to, Dan Kennedy, you know, the famous uh, copywriter, he's like, you know, there's, there's no value in being the second 
lowest price, right? You like just be the highest price, right? But but back it up with value. And so I love working with brands that want to create a truly valuable experience for the customers, have top-notch products and services. And, um, and when you're able to do that and understand that, customers are happy to pay for it. It's, it's, they, they perceive that value. Yeah. And sometimes the price is, it's the value. But if the customer really w- wants to work with you, the price doesn't become the objection. So I'll give you an example of that. I rolled into January and I raised all my prices across the board by not 5%, not 10%, try 30% across the board. Just said, that's it. I knew I was going to pull the switch. There was two reasons I did it. One, I knew 90% of my clients wouldn't balk at it because they have a value. And I was going to use it as a way to get rid of the 10% that I wanted to get rid of anyway. Yeah. So the minute they saw the price increase, they said, we're not doing this. I said, great, good luck. I wish you well. Yeah, and I think that's smart, right, in a way. And it's not it's not disingenuous either, right? Like if you want right. to provide a great experience for your customers and you want to provide top quality service, you need to have the, the financial wherewithal to do that, right? It costs money these days to run a business. And so we need to be able to do that. I also think that the value has to be looked at so like as you look at your business and you look at like increasing your prices and uh bringing on new clients i think you really do have to keep looking like what are we doing today that we should no longer be doing that's not working for our clients that we've just kind of been doing and it's not necessary and what do we need to be doing for our clients to take them to the next level i have a, a a very dear friend and client who um has a uh like a a like a spiritual healing practice. Right. And so uh, in her business, um, she's been charging the same amount for people and she goes on what she calls spirit time. Right. So everybody has like an hour long session, but sometimes it goes a little longer. Right. And she doesn't nickel and dime people. She doesn't charge them beyond that. And people start taking advantage of that. Right. And so she was in a situation where she needed to raise her prices because expenses are higher, rents, higher, electricity, everything's higher. Right. And she's running out of hours to, you know, she's trading time for money. And so as she looks at her business, she's like, you know, what do I do? And we had a long conversation about this. And I said, listen, the people that are that are used to getting a certain service level, like you can maybe grandfather them and say, listen, my prices are raising um, and here's how it's working. And because you've been with me for so long, you can buy a, you know, a six pack or whatever one last time for what this is. And that's what it is going forward. This is the new pricing. Right. And here's why. And, um, you know, and everyone was very grateful, you know, and most of them even said, you know what, I appreciate you doing that. I'm happy to pay the new prices because you're amazing. Like the value you create is amazing. So a lot of times you probably agree with this already. I know we're very aligned in a lot of stuff like it's in our head that we can't do that also. And the value like if we really think about what's happening with our clients, you know, they they are they're actually I, I know that I was feeling. Like with, with uh, there's a vendor that I work with. I'm like, you are, you're not charging me enough. You need to charge me mm-hmm. more. I feel like I'm taking advantage of you because you're doing such a great job and you're not charging me enough. Like yeah. maybe I'm crazy, right? But I, I want to pay them more because I want them to be around for a long time to be able to support our business and the others out there. So yeah, um, yeah pricing is an issue. It's, it's interesting. It's an interesting dilemma that a lot of us have. It's always, and and you shared the story about your friend, and that's exactly what I did. I said, okay, I'm doing this for three weeks. I will give you this year's pricing, but keep in mind, and the route I went was I made it clear, all grandfather pricing went away, everything. So if you were on special deals, they're gone. If you got a discount, they're gone. And here it is. And surprisingly yep. enough. Yeah, she did the same thing. She did the same thing. You had you had six, you could have six more sessions at the old price if you want to buy them in advance. Otherwise, it's gone forever. So and, I love that. And it's and it's interesting. Um, while we're on pricing, just because I like to go down this road, what do you yeah. think about discounting and people offer specials for a period? Do you think that's a good idea, a bad idea? Do you kind of say don't do it? Or if you're gonna do it, be genuine about it. Like how do you go? Yeah, I mean, this is a this is an interesting conversation and debate. So I'm in a couple of different high level masterminds, and this is always like where people take the put the yeah. boxing gloves on and they start sparring over this, right? Yeah. So there's some very and 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 everyone that I've listened to make arguments has a good argument for this. 
So the, the simple answer from me is, I don't really know. I can tell you this, like what I would do, right? So I do believe that there's uh, a time and a place to offer some discounts or savings on things. I don't know that I would offer it necessarily on your flagship products. Um, it does tend to devalue those uh, in some cases. It depends on your market. Um, you know, yeah. if everybody in your market is discounting, um, you know, you got to ask questions like, why is there a reason? Like, and if I, do I, do I want to stand out from that competition or not? And it's a, it's a decision that you need to make. Um, I do like to create different products and different things that are less expensive, right? So I might take, like, if I have a course or a training, I might take a piece of that out and sell it at a smaller price because I think it stands alone on its own and it can create a lot of value for people. And it also, and it'll help them. And it also gives them a sampling, a taste of the full picture of other things that they might want to do. So, um, so a lot of times I'll do something like that. I'll pull something out of a, of a course or a program or a training or something like that where I'll do that. Um, the other thing I do is I'll create a special product for a special scenario. So like, instead of like for Black Friday, I see people like will discount all their products and sell them for a small yes. amount of money. I might have a product that I only sell on Black Friday that you can't get other times of year and that's the special deal that I make. So it's not that I'm discounting something else. Um, yes. So it's a personal thing, right? It's, um, I my sense though is, uh, I, I, like, I like to have establish a value and kind of and keep that value there. Yeah, I would agree yeah. with you. Um, so moving on for pricing a little bit, let's let's talk storytelling because that's a fun one. How do, yeah. you, how do you think storytelling impacts the customer journey? And I think it's an underused technique, personally. Uh, well, so I think storytelling is everything. Um, so, uh, so this is, this one's near and dear to my heart. So thank you for this question. Um, look, I think the reason like in, in our business, we have a, a program called the kinetic customer formula. And what we do is we help small business owners really understand the journey that their customers go on. And, and once we understand the journey, we try and remove all the friction, right? Take yeah. all the objections, all the obstacles as out of the way as we can, or reduce the amount of friction as much as we can. Then we look at the points where there's still some tension, still more difficult, or people maybe like not have the right motivation. And we look at how do we induce or boost momentum in those moments. So what we're really doing is we're building what I call like a water slide. So you imagine yeah. you're on this like wonderful water slide, there's plenty of water flowing, and you're able to just kind of effortlessly go down it versus the water slide you're on and there's not quite enough water and you're like always getting stuck and you're like frustrated. And you're like, ah, I got to try and move again, right? And so I like to think of our, our customer journey really as what we call a kinetic pathway, something that like allows you to flow through that. And when you do that, right, there's stories that are being built by the customer, right? And those stories of their success are the stories that they're going to tell probably along the way if you give them enough uh, reasons to tell the story along the way, but most importantly, they're going to tell them at the end and they're going to feel compelled to because it was exciting for them. They got the results and they felt really good. And so as we help people craft that kinetic pathway, it's always with the end in mind. So what we do is we start at the end. We'd say like, what is the world's best customer testimonial that you could get? Right. And so we look at our different avatars, our different, you know, prototypical clients, and we say to them, if they were, they just finished our, our an engagement with us, whatever that is, an online course, shopping in our store, a yoga session, whatever your business happens to be, they just finished it and they loved it and it was really good. What would they go and tell somebody about it? Like, what would the juicy words be? What would they talk about? Like at, at the beginning, maybe they had some, some trepidation about starting, or maybe they were like all in, whatever it was for them. What would that journey be? And so we have our customers write this out. We call this the ideal customer script. What would that ideal customer say that yeah. it was so wonderful? And then from there, we reverse engineer it. So what we're doing, Rob, is we're creating like little mile markers or little, uh, little yeah. triggers all along the way so that they are capturing the story that we want them to tell at the end all through the journey. And so they actually live that journey authentically. And it's not, it's not manipulative in that what we're doing is we're literally giving them this ideal experience because we've designed it. 
it's like the perfect Disney experience, if you will, right? And of course, nothing's perfect, but but really trying to get it to that place. And as they go through that, the stories that come out of that, that becomes the best marketing for your business, right? Yes. Like I believe I see all these gurus, all these marketers out there teaching us how to fill our funnel, how to use Facebook ads, how to use Google, how to use TikTok, Pinterest, you know, YouTube, you name it, right? And all that's important. But if once they get in, they buy it, let's say they actually buy it, all that stuff works, but they don't get the results from our product or our service or our programs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that we spent that. They're going to ask for a refund or they're going to leave a negative review where they're not going to tell other people. And what if every time one customer came in, they told two others? All of a sudden, yes. your business has this compounding effect. And the reason that they will and that'll end up happening, it is the stories. It comes yes. back to your marketing that the front end, all the stuff that you're going to start doing when you fix the back end, when you do what we teach you to do and you make this, this kinetic side, this kinetic pathway of your business work, the, the marketing is your customer success. Your customers mm -hmm. are your marketing and they become, you know, we, this army of raving fans, but they become your sales force. Like your customers become your unpaid yeah. sales force because they feel this compulsion to do it. And it's their story. So when they're telling it, it's authentic. They're like, like they live it. Like when they're telling you like the engagement, the energy, the excitement, it's real because they're reliving the wonderful experience they just had. And so yeah. every business that's not capitalizing on these stories, and this is true on the inside of your business. I'm only talking about your customers, but your employee experiences too. The, like I talk to people all the time about like they have retention problems with their employees or they're having a problem like attracting great talent. They're not getting the, the caliber of employees that they want. This fixes that too because it's exciting to work for a business that's creating such momentum and results for their customers, right? And, and yep. when we remove friction for our customers or from our customer's journey, we actually remove friction from our employee's journey as well. We make yeah, it a that, more fun and easier place to work. That is so true. Um, in that, you mentioned refunds, and I like to go there because yeah, refunds are a, a, are a pain in the you know where. We've all had them. Yep. Customers not happy. You're past the 30 days. Um, customer still wants a refund. They don't care. I've seen some yep. interesting ways of handling refunds. Um, a couple of businesses in the Toronto area handle businesses. If you're part of their loyalty program, they extend your days for a refund. So we were, my partner and I were out shopping in a well-known store and uh, their policy is if you have a loyalty card, you get 30 days to do an exchange or refund, not 10. So that's mm. how they handle it. Um, yeah. How do you, how do you handle refund objections? Like how would you handle? Um, well, so I, I, I like that idea of like, if we have a long-term relationship in place, like you're part of my loyalty program, right? Yeah. You have a special, you, have, you get something special in advance to reward loyalty, right? I like that idea, right? I believe very much in reward and recognition. Uh, yeah. So I think that's great. Uh, so yay, kudos to them. And, and online businesses, um, especially online businesses that have like, some kind of subscription or membership program. Yeah. This is a great way for them to think about it. If you're in our membership, then you can actually get extended refund terms on all of our other products and services, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's a it's an interesting way to kind of help with retention within your membership. Um, but I look, I'm 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 a little bit weird this way, right? Like I don't want someone in my program if they don't like it. I agree. So, so I would rather refund somebody, even if it's beyond the time frame, than have them be unhappy. And uh, it's because I don't want their money. I want their success. And if they aren't able to find success with us, then I want them to go find success elsewhere. So, um, so what I what I would do. Um, and what we do as a matter of, uh, you know, our operations here is, you know, we have a stated refund policy. Um, and if someone comes in and they, we have conditional refunds also, like if they, if they try and do the work, like if they haven't opened it up and they haven't made any effort, that's different than if they have made some effort and they're not enjoying it or they're not getting the value from it for some reason. Um, yeah. What I would like to know though is why, right? Because our whole mission is to help people get results. 
And so I would rather kind of talk you out. I'm not the person that's like, look, no matter what, come into our program, you can get your money back. Like, it's like, look, if you feel like this is a good program for you, then come on, let's do this. And mm -hmm. if it's not working out, then you can have your money back. But it's not like mm -hmm. come in no matter what, just do it, just do it, do it now. You have five minutes left and then you can get your money back. I don't want to pull in all the, the people that are sitting on the fence that aren't committed. Like, I believe that when people purchase something, it's an intention, not a commitment, right? And I want a commitment because when I have committed people, committed people get results, right? People that are on the fence, they don't get results, right? That's and that's true. true in almost anything in life. And so what I try and do with customers that come into my world is I try and, and, and get a commitment to them to the result. And if this is not the result you want, then this is not the time for us. Maybe there's a time for us later. And it's not that I don't want to help you. It's that I know that I can best help you when you're like, heck yes, I'm going to make this happen. I will, I will show up and do uh, you know, more than 100% of my side if I have a committed client. But if they're not committed, I can't force them over the finish line. I'm not going to be able to help them. Right. And so we try and be like we talked about expectation setting earlier. I try and really set expectations like what is the right fit client for us look like? And in my business, it doesn't matter if you have a brick and mortar business or you have an online business. What it matters is that you're a committed business owner, right? That you actually are looking to create an experience for your customers that helps them get results, that helps them increase their engagement, that helps them, you know, become whatever version of themselves that they want to become, right? That's, that's what's important to me. And so when it comes to refunds, I do think having a risk reversal kind of, which is really what a refund is, a guarantee of some sort, I think yep. that's an important piece. And obviously it's required like, like legally, you know, depending on what country you're in, where you do business, whatever, there's credit cards and whatever, there's requirements for that, right? So we got to meet the obligations of the law. But I think philosophically speaking, like it should be there to help when there's a real problem. But I don't think people should get in unless they're really feeling like this is the right thing to do. Yeah, I uh, love that answer. So you work with um, companies to help them foster their uh, customers. Tell, tell me a little bit about your formula and how it works. Yeah, so um, in a nutshell, there's, you know, we believe there's, there's this idea of the result, the ideal result that yeah. we want, right? And for all of us, we want our customers to rave about the process, right? Like, oh yeah. my gosh, I just worked with Rob and studying digital media. It was amazing. Like, I couldn't even believe that this was possible, right? So they're raving about it. We want them to renew. Like if you have a monthly service or you have an annual service, we want them to renew that ongoing service. We want them to uh, repeat and buy other products and services from us. Maybe they buy a higher level product or service, or maybe they buy a different product or service. And ultimately we want them to recruit other businesses and customers into our ecosystem. That to me is success. And we believe that that comes from a combination of four factors, right? Attitudes of customers, behaviors. So what are they thinking and expecting? What are they doing? The friction, what is stopping them from getting results and momentum? How can we increase the likelihood of them staying engaged? And so what we have is a formula that we've created that we've been, you know, we battle tested over the last 30 years. I know I don't look that old, thank you. Um, but in all seriousness, <laughs> like we, we battle tested this and it's what we've used with everyone from, you know, the Disney's of the world to the universities to small entrepreneurs, small businesses. Yeah. And, and what we do is we go through and we analyze your journey and what we do it based on your actual customers. So we look at your customers and we create these prototypical customers avatars, which, you know, everyone in the marketing world talks about, but we do it on a slightly deeper level. Right. And so the way we think about it, again, bringing in my theater background is we think about it as if you were going to play the character, the role of your customer on stage. If you oh, had to do it believably, if you're like yes. Matthew McConaughey and you had to get into character and act them out realistically, what would they be saying? What would they, they be thinking? What would they be driving? How would they be interacting? Would they be angry? Would they be frustrated? Would they, are they get up early in the morning? Like what brands are they like? All the basic stuff that everyone thinks about with Avatar, but then also that other bit. How do you authentically portray them? And when you can step into their shoes, it's a different game. And then mm -hmm. once you're in their shoes, we actually have you walk their journey in their shoes. Not from the perspective of the, the company, which is what we mostly do, but really from the perspective of the customer. And 
it's an interesting experience, right? Most people that come in and kind of go through this experience with us, they have some kind of very emotional reaction. And a lot of times it's crying and, and frustration yes. at themselves because they have that, that epiphany of like, oh gosh, we really are making it hard. Like, I can't believe we're doing this. I never had any clue. Right. And so when yeah. we go through that, that's when we can then go in, we can really analyze it. We can pull away the friction. We can reduce that. We can find opportunities to add momentum. We can figure out where we need to set expectations. Like just because someone has a problem, let's say in step five, that might mean that we had to set an expe expectation in step one, right? Not at step four. And so we really get to see it. And, and honestly, we map these big boards out, Rob, and it's, it's so transformational for our customer. It's like, it's the most fun thing I've ever done in my life because you see the epiphanies that people are having throughout yeah. it and they leave with an actionable game plan to like fix this stuff. And you know, you, you, you pick, you prioritize. What is the biggest obstacle that's stopping people? So I had a woman just totally like, not even like a, a business case, it was an author, right? And so she had a book and she was finding that she was having a hard time getting people to read past chapter two. Why? And so we did the same map because it, it got too jargony and too technical. And so yeah. like she was losing people and she was not, she was giving them all the information. It was from her perspective. She has the curse of knowledge. She knows too much, right? But her customer wasn't ready for all that yet. And so we rejiggered some of this and she, she put this out in a different way. And all of a sudden people are getting the end. And she put motivational, like little side author's notes saying, listen, on the other side of this chapter is a massive breakthrough. It's hard. I get it hit the gas pedal and power through this because there's unbelievable amazingness on the other side, right? In her words, yeah. whatever she said. And they did. And it was just that little dose of momentum that they needed yeah. to just get over the hill. It's like when you're driving the car and you kind of like coasting, as long as you're going straight or downhill, the car's going to keep moving. But if it starts going uphill, you got to hit the gas pedal. Otherwise it's not going to keep going. Right. Yeah. Or the electric, if you're a Tesla fan, right? So whatever it is, you got to stay with them. And so in our program, we really go through that. And so the formula helps you look at all of those things, attitudes, behaviors, friction, momentum, and how do we achieve that result? And we break it down by every moment that people have with you before they even find you. So we look at like their journey of discovery of your business all the way through to, again, renewal and buying other products and services. And uh, it's, a, it's a powerful tool. And, you know, over the years, as we've refined this and, and we've just made it more and more actionable um, and we've worked with businesses in every every possible industry. So it applies to, you know, it's like I know that when you're talking to everyone, you're talking to no one, but it really is a people, right? It's, yeah. it's about people and how people work. So it applies to any business online, offline or whatever. And and it's just something that I think, especially nowadays with AI and and the way the world's working and, and it's getting more and more competitive. <laughs> the only true way to kind of have your fingerprint, your uniqueness, it is your experience. It's not the true. physical products, it's not the service, it's the way people feel after interacting with your business. Yeah. So since you went there and mentioned in two most dreaded word letters in marketing called AI, and you had yes. to go there. I had to, uh, I and we, Yeah, I know you can. It's the buzzword these days. You can thank Chat GPT for that a year ago. We we sure. know we know Microsoft's a big player in open AI and copilot. We know Google's doing some amazing things with Bard right now. Um how does AI play into all this? Does it? Doesn't it? Is it just kind of a tool? Like where do you sit with that? Uh well, so I think AI is awesome. Um okay. And I think AI is, um, I think it's an opportunity to be a great tool for us, for all yes. of us, right? So um, what I've heard it called as, you know, a, a, like a joke, but it's really powerful to me is um, accelerated intelligence, right? Yes. It helps you move faster. It gets you information in ways that you can process it faster. Um, amplified intelligence, mm -hmm. right? Um, like losing that artificial idea. And so for me, I find it to be a fun brainstorming tool. Like it's having like a cool kind of sparring partner with me when I'm trying to brainstorm yeah. something. Um, or it's a great tool for me when I'm trying to um, get insight into my avatar. Like if I'm trying to figure out how, um, you know, 
how to play this customer on stage. I use that, you know, that example just a little while ago. This will help me think about those people, right? So one of my one of my good friends, Will Hamilton, he has a he's a an online tennis instructor, right? He has like one of the largest online tennis instructing platforms oh, yeah. out there. Yeah, it's called fuzzyyellowballs.com. Definitely worth the check out. He's he's an awesome awesome human. Um, he also is studying uh, how to be a stand up comedian, and he's cool. using the the art of uh, like writing jokes in writing copy to, you know, in marketing. And it's really kind of interesting, the parallels between the two. He uses AI to find out interesting things to help write better jokes or write better copy. So he'll write, he'll put down there, like if, so let's say I was going to market that, um, that jewelry store. Right. Yeah. And, and you, you know, he's, he's trying to find a way to get a, uh, a 25 year old male to come by from him. He would say, you know, um, as a 25-year-old male who's afraid of uh, picking the wrong ring, what are the top five things that he's worried about? And it might come up with five things, and that helps him kind of understand what those fears yeah. were. He might say, so if I was able to eliminate this fear, what might be true? And then AI will come back and give him some other ideas. So it's just helping him think through like what's going on in the heads of those people, and it's a powerful tool. That said, you know, there's also people that are coming up with products and services that aren't their own, and like having AI generate it and go out there tomorrow and competing with other people that have products and services, right? And so yeah. that's where I think the experience is the great equalizer, right? Like I've I been do. saying it for 30 years, right? Like it's more important today than ever before. I like sound like a broken record. If you go back and listen to me on stage 30 years ago, very awkward young kid. And today on stage, I'm saying the same thing, right? It, the most important thing is the experience that customers have with your business. That is what's yeah. gonna be the great equalizer. And so AI is a tool. It's not gonna replace people. What's gonna be more important for everybody that's listening to this is you really do need to put on that lens of your customer. You need to walk, a walk the walk in their shoes. You mm -hmm. need to see what they're experiencing because that's gonna be mm -hmm. what decides if you're here tomorrow or not. No, I agree with you. I think, um, I think AI is just making my job and your job probably more easier. It's doing some of that background work for us. And, you know, I I think I saw a presentation last week um, by Canda Post. And part of it, it was really interesting. Part was Gen X, sorry, Gen Z, which is the younger generation. And part of it yep. was AI. And the gentleman who did the AI presentation said, listen, you want the best way to learn AI? Throw thirty dollars at Chat GPT for Copilot for a month and go try it and go play. That's the best thirty dollars you're gonna spend. Yeah, I think it's interesting though. So in a, a mastermind that I run, um, yeah. we've got everybody using it now. And what's interesting is their team. Like, here's the thing: more often than not, your team is already using it, but they think that they're gonna get in trouble, so they're not letting you know. And so we, <laughs> we've actually made it be a requirement of our teams. Like, we want you to use it and play with yeah. it and um and utilize it and see like what can we make easier how can we be using our skills in a you know in our unique abilities and our zones of genius in an even better way because we're able to offload some of these other things into automated ways and so i think it's a really powerful tool and i think we should all be embracing it and i do think that those that kind of like snub their nose up at it and and don't don't figure out how to embrace it in some way are going to be sorry that they hadn't spent a few minutes on it you know yeah, I would agree. And I and the big thing about being in this business is we're always learning. So, you know, if you're anything to do with marketing and agency technical, you're always learning. I mean, and we all learn different ways, podcasts, books. I'm an oh, avid yeah. reader. I'm I'm still a book a week guy. So I, I read one you, book man. a Me week. Too. Yeah. And I I love to read. And you know, somebody said my mom was talking to me earlier today and she said how many books do you have on your nightstand? And I said, right now I got seven of them. And that doesn't count to three uh, Kindle books on the go when I'm on the road. So, yeah, you know, exactly. I, I'm I'm there. So you you find your, your learning consumption network and just keep learning. And it's just, I think we're at a fascinating time right now, personally. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, you know, AI is uh, here with us. I think it's going to be here for the duration. So uh, if you're on the fence about it, play with it. Learn a little yeah. bit more about it. Be curious. Jump in, jump in now. Don't wait. 
Yeah. Yeah. I really just be curious. That. I think being curious is, is a great thing, you know, and learn a little bit. Yeah, I I agree with you. Um, if somebody wants to uh, learn more about the CX formula, how's the best way? Yeah, so I've got, uh, well, first you can go to our website, cxformula.com. Um, thanks for the kind words about it earlier. You can check us out. Yeah. But I actually, um, I have a special PDF just for you guys, uh, your people, Rob, if that's cool. Um, yeah, if they sure go is. To, yeah, if they go to gift.cxformula.com, forward slash SDM for stunning digital media. I've got a special PDF there. Um, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to create a little curiosity, right? So here's what I'm going to tease you with. It's freaking awesome. It's an amazing strategy that's also actionable. And um, it'll take you 10 minutes to go through it. And so uh, it's going to give you some ways to think about your business a little bit differently that you can actually do something with. Um, I only ask two things. One, if you go there and you download it, Actually, open it up and take a look at it, please. Uh, don't let it just sit on your hard drive collecting dust and digital dust. And two, um, my email's in there. Shoot me an email. Let me know what you think about it. I'd love to hear from you, uh, hear your thoughts, and uh, and see if there's a way we can help you with your business. Yeah, and what I would tell you is, uh, knowing Jason, this PDF is going to be awesome because him and his team are awesome. So, oh, so thanks, man. You Appreciate so, you. Um, real quickly, if somebody wants to reach out to you, email is the best way or are you on any socials? Uh, we're on a whole bunch of socials. Um, I'll make sure you have all the links to put below this because I can't even remember them all right now. But okay. um, if you hit us up at cxformula.com, there's a way to send us a note or uh, all of our socials are on there as well. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. And you have yourself an awesome weekend, my friend. Awesome, buddy. Thank you, Rob. This show is brought to you by StunningDigitalMarketing.com, your Toronto leader in digital marketing services. Not only do we protect your WordPress website, we can help you with your site, provide social media management for your business, or even do one-on-one -on -one consulting. To find out more, go to StunningDigitalMarketing.com. A very special thank you to Jason Friedman for joining me on this edition of the SDM Show. Hey, everybody, Rob here again. Thanks for listening to the SDM Show. It's such a pleasure to have you every week. If you want more on our agency website, go to stunningdigitalmarketing.com. We are your WordPress security experts. We'd be glad to help you out. If you want to learn more about me, Rob Cairns, go to meetrobcairns.online. From there, you can find links to everything I do on the web, as well as book time with me. So feel free. If you want to make comments about this podcast or know a guest possibly suitable for the podcast, please email us at podcast at stunningdigitalmarketing.com or Conversely, you can go to X, formerly known as Twitter, and tweet at me at Rob Cairns. This podcast is dedicated to my late father, Bruce Cairns. Dad, I miss you very much, and I love you. Please join us next week for another interesting podcast, and have a great weekend, my